Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Binance Podcast. My name is Wee Jo. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Binance. So what I want to do with this show is to spend time talking to specialists, entrepreneurs, scholars, influencers, basically leading people from a variety of industries. Hopefully through these conversations, we can share insights on how blockchain is changing not just these different industries, but also in changing the world. Here's a quick disclaimer. All opinions expressed by our host and our guests on this podcast are merely their own opinions. They do not imply any endorsements or opinions of their companies. You should not take these opinions as specific investment advice, as you will be solely responsible for your own investment. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Binance Podcast. Uh, Today, uh, we're extremely, extremely lucky to have an amazing uh, person, Mr. Spencer Dinwiddie, who's a professional basketball player for the Brooklyn Nets. He's going to be joining my favorite player of all time, Kyrie, is going to actually going to be joining uh, his team. And then hopefully, you know, bring some really exciting basketball. But outside of basketball as a whole, Spencer's been making a lot of news recently, being an uh, early mover and an early innovator almost to, to, to a certain extent in the cryptocurrency space with his, with his ambitious attempt or going through to tokenize his, uh, his salary going forward. So Spencer, thanks for joining the Binance Podcast. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. We said, I was here with Spencer um, with the Brooklyn Nets. I, I would say with Kyrie, it's, yes, he's technically joining the team I was on, but it is his team. So maybe it's a little bit of both, me joining his team and him joining my team. Uh, but um, yeah. It's just... you, you did get there first. So. <laughs> <laughs> technically I did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure any of our listeners are actually NBA fans, um, but I do know that they're all crypto enthusiasts and blockchain, you know, uh, enthusiasts as well. Can you give us a little bit of background about your history in terms of where you come from? Because I know you from New Orleans, right? That's so like Nola is like you originally, and then you play. Where did you play college ball? No, no, no. So when I say I'm from LA, that actually means Los Angeles, not Louisiana. I play college ball at uh, the University of Colorado. They're a Pac-12 school, so obviously they're primarily based in the West Coast. So I got to play close to home, which was uh, a lot of fun for me. In terms of blockchain, like I actually first heard about Bitcoin in 2014 from one of my friends in the finance industry. But, you know, I had just got into the league and I was too scared that I was going to, you know, lose my money and all this other stuff. And, you know, just, just kind of that, that fear, right? And so that's why I didn't get into it when he when he first told me about it. Circling back to 2017, that's when I first got in, like really got into it and put some money into it. I, I was fortunate enough to catch some of the bull run, you know, the historic bull run of, of that year. You know, obviously, if I had been using a, a lot of money at the time, I obviously have a lot of money right now or a lot more, I guess. But uh, I, I was kind of treating it as just smaller money, kind of gambling money, like money I was definitely... 1000% fine to lose. But experiencing the bull run and the subsequent crash, it, it really spurred me to want to learn about like the space and not just learn about Bitcoin, but learn about blockchain technology in general. And so that's really, I guess we can credit the bull run for making me want to take this deep dive into the true technology and the knowledge behind it. And that's why we're here now. I worked in LA for a couple of years, uh, about some t- before I joined Binance. So I wasn't into crypto at all until about sort of, not necessarily the bull run, but a couple of companies that I actually invested in at the seed level ended up doing ICOs. And I think that's when I ended up holding on some of the tokens. When they asked me, so like, what do I do with these tokens? They're like, oh, you can uh, put them on Binance and sell them. I was like, oh, this is an interesting idea. <laughs> so that's, that, was, that was my first yeah. experience. So, so I actually didn't own any Bitcoin before then. Do you do any investments on the side, or is is it just primarily sort of secondary markets that you that you sort of participate in? You mean uh, investing in like C stage, like VC or yeah, yeah, yeah. like ICO so stuff a, like that? Yeah, just, just just in terms of like general financial investment. Can you just walk through sort of like you know you have you come into you know some salary or initially, and then and then just sort of like how do you manage your money in general, and then what percentage of that do you look at in terms of because you mentioned that when you first approached it, just sort of like you know this this amount of money I can do without it's okay, it's like gambling money, but how how do you look at it in general in terms from an investing perspective and managing your own portfolio? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, now, you know, I, I look at crypto as obviously its own asset class because I believe in it so much, allocating it, my money between that and then obviously real estate, because I really believe in real estate. My dad was a realtor for a long time. Those are what going forward, probably going to be two really big core pieces of my portfolio. I also do some early stage, uh, you know, VC funding. Um, and angel investing, I guess, would be, the, would be the proper term for that. So, you know, certain companies being able to co-brand and use my likeness and then also putting in a little bit of money and et cetera. But I understand that's also a very risky space but I would say the I'm always pretty bullish on on land right they're not making any more land and depending upon the areas that you you get it it's fairly safe mm -hmm. well, that's pretty similar to my thing is that like real estate and crypto <laughs> can you tell us about like how did you buy your first Bitcoin was that through your financial advisors or did you actually try to do it yourself online no no, no. I, I did it myself online um, early to mid 2017 what do you think has changed in the market since you first started looking at it I would say with all the ICOs that were were coming out, it, it seemed like a lot of people were trying to grab funds because, you know, a lot of people had these promises to change the world. Um, and obviously everybody can't change the world. Um, so so it started to become a little probably too saturated. Um, now that it started to kind of consolidate and pare down, people are becoming more focused. I, I actually think people are going sometimes too far in the Bitcoin only direction. I do think there are other use cases for blockchain technology in general, um, even though obviously Bitcoin is, is the far and away the leader. Um, I just think it needs to be a, a healthy balance and we're gonna start to see that as it really starts to disrupt different industries. Yeah, one of the things that I say is just basically, you need more use cases. Right. And I think Bitcoin yeah. was basically one of the original use case, which is the storage of money or the storage of value. It's just like the digital goal. You can store it and much more conveniently, but it has all the other characteristics of gold. But I think there are going to be other types of digital currencies or digital assets that's going to come out that's going to have different types of use cases. And I think that brings up uh, some of the news that, that you've been making. Can you walk us through your thoughts behind tokenizing your own salary, the concept and the idea of that? Because I think that's something that I'm very, very interested in learning about. I'll tell you my mega idea about, about how to disrupt NBA <laughs> with tokens. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so the way this was kind of born for me was uh, just looking at our league. Like um, a lot of guys have seen themselves as just, just strictly employees. When in all actuality, like we're the asset, right? We're the revenue generating vehicle. Every night we go out there and play a game, it's like a blank canvas and our intellectual property paints that canvas. And that's what the NBA and collectively we're selling to consumers, right? So if the NBA is a broker selling something and the fan is determining value, right? Whatever they're willing to pay for it, and we are the asset, then every asset has its own asset class. And that means that each individual, obviously in that asset class, is its own business and can offer whatever type of fixed income or futures or derivative or whatever type of financial product that they want to offer, right? Because they are their own business. Whether they want to tie in, you know, MBA type of compensation or, or endorsement type of compensation or, or whatever they want to do that, that highlights their business and what they're going after, they have the freedom and the reign to do it, right? It's all in the spirit of, owning their own likeness, having that autonomy, having that added uh, financial freedom and other options with their money to hopefully do some good things. And then also for the athletes specifically, you know, taking the contrarian view of like athletes going broke, right? We've, we've heard so much and we've done all the fear mongering, but it's still been a situation where it happens, right? You know, mm -hmm. because guys establish a lifestyle that they can't sustain after they leave the league because it's usually not, you know, right after they leave the NBA, that they go broke, which means they're not spending every single dollar. So they are saving a little bit, but it's four or five years out. It's because that lifestyle is eating into the funds they saved. Well, what if we were able to get them their money up front in a fixed income product, but we locked it in a sort of reserve or a trust or something like that. And we mm -hmm. had them start living off interest from the beginning, then mm -hmm. into perpetuity, theoretically, they would never have to touch the principal, which means they would never actually be broke. Right. Unless obviously something crazy happened and they, somebody, got into trouble or whatever. Like, obviously there would be reasons to unlock the reserve, you know, if there was catastrophic reasons, right? But- Almost like creating a trust. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and make it so people start that financial education early, right? And so now mm -hmm. maybe they're investing their endorsement money and living off the interest from their principal. And so if some of their endorsement money goes into some BC and it blows up, then yeah, they're rich. But if not, they don't jeopardize their futures 
you know, based upon how they are when they're 19 or 20 or 21, because we all know that we, we continue to grow our knowledge base every day that we're on this earth. Right. And when we can't, always just expect a 19 year old to make you know the same decisions that a 30 year old would make i think that's one of the biggest not the issues but i think one of the the unique nature of of professional athletes is that the earning curve peaks in early in the career whereas a lot of the professional it peaks much much later so your spending uh, gets mismatched and that causes a lot of the issues that we see in terms of like going broke stories that are out there yeah so i think like whatever token format that you can use to try to capture the value early in your career or maximize the value that you capture early such that you can elongate, I think, your earning curve or your earning power. That's actually a really, really, really interesting business model. And, exactly. and uh, how did you come up, come upon this? Like, did you, do you have advisors that you're working with on this or like what kind of blockchain are you using on this? Is that just sort of still in the conceptual phase right now? No, no. So, so conceptualizing the concept happened about a year ago. Like I was, you know, I, I made my own shoe and I've kind of been going on this whole path of like intellectual property and, and trying to own your own likeness and, and maximize the value of the individual, right? And, and so it was kind of a natural progression evolution. When it got time to build it and we started building it about nine months or so ago, um, I, I got a team uh, called Saffron Solutions, formerly uh, several consensus employees to help me build it and project manage it and go forward. And they've been phenomenal um, in the process. And so we built Initially, obviously, this one on, on Ethereum, um, you know, it has the most wallets right now. It's a, one of the easiest mm-hmm. blockchains to build on. So uh, my first offering will, will be host on that. We're pretty much done. Um, don't, we're we're going to meet with the league again about this whole, uh, not only my offering, but, but the concept and the process as a whole. But for the most part, we're, we're pretty much done. We have all the partners enlisted, Paxos of the Divs. Yeah, like, like we're, we're in a pretty good place. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we'd love to sort of hear about, continue to, to, to learn about it and then see how Binance can help. Because if you do need to offer those tokens to people on a global basis uh, outside the United States, we would love to figure out a way to get involved in it. Because <laughs> I think we do have hey, an extremely, would... power, yeah, extremely powerful distribution platform for you. One of the things that, there's two businesses that I kind of explored that was actually really interesting. One is uh, there's a company in the U.S. called the Authentic Brands Group. I'm not sure if you've heard of those guys, but they're the ones that actually bought Shaq's like image about a couple of years ago. And then I think they also own the image rights to like Michael Jackson, Marilyn Monroe, maybe not Michael, but maybe Elvis. So they can basically print that. So every time those images are printed on like t-shirts and hats, that company mm-hmm. gets paid. And then the family trust basically gets paid as well. So I do think that, and then one of the, the ideas is that um, for a lot of celebrities is like your likeness basically has value. And then how do you capture that? I guess that's more through, I would say, uh, the traditional format, right? Putting your image and stuff uh, to sell commercial items. But in the digital space, I think there's actually a lot more interesting things that we can explore. Uh, Because I know, at least for you, you, you you're in a a pretty cool poker game with the Tron guys. And then also, I think my boss, CZ, was in that poker game as well. Yeah, no, I was. Uh, I'm not a very good poker player, but it was was (laughs) fun being, being able to be in those guys' presence. I'll pitch you my idea. Maybe you can pitch it to Kyrie and KD when you see them. It's basically right now, the ownership structure in the NBA, I think it's pretty concentrated. And there's pretty concentrated within like, you know, 30 individuals, right? Just call them whatever they are, right? And then as you mentioned before, you know, the player is actually becoming much more, they're, they're like the most important assets in the league, right? Other than maybe the franchises. And then one of my ideas I had going forward is like, if you are a very powerful player, not just in terms of like on the court, but like in terms of global presence off the court, like guys like LeBron or Steph or something like that, yeah. like they could actually go and say raise, you know, X billion dollars through the blockchain. And then basically raising through the tokenized format for example, if LeBron has like, I don't know, like 30 million fans around the world and he's able to raise a thousand dollars from each one of them. I mean, that's 30 million plus three more zero. That's three million dollars he can raise. Bam. And then everybody gives, makes LeBron the GP and then he, he can go out and acquire his own franchise. And then each one of the fans will basically own a token in the franchise, name a team, right? And then they would basically, you know, nominate LeBron to be the manager of, or the owner that represents their interest. Right. And then LeBron himself can put some capital up front. Cause I, cause I just think that it's a global game. And then also it, yeah. it allows, it returns sort of like the true owners to the fans and to the players. No, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. That that's actually uh, one of the use cases that we 
sort of talked about. So not in that same uh, direction that you went, but uh, you know, when when meeting with the NBA, I kind of used this example. I said, you know, we we understand that every NBA owner right now, right, wants. 51% financial ownership of the team, but wants 100% like decision-making power. I said the only way you can do that is if, you know, those 40, that 49% of those shares you sell to the fans. And so the fans get to have that buy-in. They get to have that ownership. They won't get to have the decision-making uh, capability because you'll be the far and away, obviously, the majority shareholder. But, like, you'll be fine, right? Because if you go to another billionaire and ask him to take 49% of your team, but you don't want him to have – any board seat, any executive decisions, any say in who you sign, anything like that, they're not going to go for that. You know, they're not going to want to no. be a part of anything like that. Or they'll mm-hmm. just wait and try to institute like a hostile takeover or something like that, right? Like, it's not going to be an amicable relationship where if you divide that 49% amongst the fans through factionalized ownership, which is something that, you know, the company fan shares is, is easily capable of doing for the league, sat down with him, I said, like, you know, we're here to help. We're here to be partners. We're not here to burn everything to the ground or do something crazy. You know, we, we want to, you know, help the league and, and give you guys what, what you want as well, added liquidity mm-hmm. and also added fan engagement. Yeah, that really makes a lot of sense because I think um, NBA fans are, it's, it's actually the, the only real global North American sport or American sport, much more global than, yeah. um, I think, baseball, football, or even hockey. And that's yeah. true much more so in Asia I think even growing now in India and you're, you know, Europe and Africa without saying already. So it's, it's actually second only, I think to soccer right now, but growing like many of the younger kids and then sort of like, if you can figure out a way to engage with that fan by giving him quote unquote interest, or, you know, any kind of interest in the team or the franchise, because I'm starting with the player and that's actually really, really cool as well. Cause like, if you think about it, like the major decisions, like maybe player movements, who they sign that stays, but in terms of like, you know, what jerseys they wear on what nights, <laughs> what are the, what new exactly. uniforms they use, right? Like what, exactly. uh, you can, you can institute you know, a like, vote and that would, that'd yeah, be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. And then the fans can go in and be like, Oh yeah. Like that Jersey for sure. And then, or, you know, team shoes, team bus, team music, <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. The, and then the fans like, you know, with their token of ownership in the team, they can get become much, much more engaged. And then if the team does well, then maybe the fans token increases in value. <laughs> It uh, leaves a lot more into the imagination than what it is today, I think, especially if the league wants to engage, um, you know, their viewers and their fans on a global basis. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm 1000 percent with you. And, and that's been our biggest conversation with the, the NBA uh, to date so far. Thank you very much, Spencer, for your time uh, on, on, uh, on the Binance podcast. And then, uh, you know, please do stay in touch. And then I know we have a couple of other stuff that we're going to try to follow up on. OK. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as as much I did. If you like this show, please share this episode on Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, WeChat, or any other social media platforms. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Binance Podcast and see you next time.